the mountains of northern Iraq, home to Turkey's Kurdish rebels. They're growing in number and they nurse age-old grievances. I'm totally amazed about how young they are. Europe has largely forgotten about the Kurdish fighters, but Turkey's old war has restarted. All of them say they want to go and fight in Turkey. So I suspect if things do heat up this year, some of these people will be heading across the border in that direction. Istanbul, historic crossing point between Asia and Europe, a city with the war reigniting just as Turkey tries to join the European Union. We're um, driving into this right-wing Turkish nationalist area where there was a bomb attack in an internet cafe that's frequented by riot police. This was the second recent bombing in Istanbul by Kurdish rebels renewing a campaign of violence. This is it here, and they're rebuilding it. New plaster. Yeah, you can see where the bomb damage that spattered bits here. This looks like just sort of dirt on the ground, but it is in fact um, rather grimly human flesh of the people that were looking at Yahoo or Google one minute and then uh, splattered all over the wall the next. A cafe owner was across the road in his shop when the bomb exploded. He told me that he saw the lacerated body of the internet cafe owner. And the worst thing he said was seeing the children who were terribly badly injured in this attack. He said that if he was in government, he would punish them by nailing them up by their fingers each day until they died. The bombing in Istanbul has its roots 600 miles away and in years of resentment towards the Turkish state. We traveled south and east towards the Kurdish heartland and the city of Diyarbakir. Kurds make up 20% of Turkey's population. Thousands of Turkish troops here are once more facing off against the main rebel group, the PKK. We were getting close to Diyarbakir. Nearby, we found the deserted ruins of a Kurdish village destroyed by the Turkish army in the 1990s. This looks like it's someone's front door and it's sort of almost been buried. I don't know what happened here exactly in this particular village, but what I do know is that it was caught up in the war between the PKK and the Turkish government. The war cost more than 35,000 lives on both sides. Somewhere in these hills live pockets of PKK guerrillas ready to attack the army. Others work undercover in the cities. We arrived in Diyarbakir. Nearby, there had been a shootout between the army and the PKK. We've heard that the families of two dead PKK fighters are about to try to pick up their bodies from this hospital. Yeah, there's a lot of men around here waiting. Sympathizers for the dead fighters were there, using the deaths as a focus for protest. There's clearly some plainclothes officers right there. You probably see over my shoulder. It's a man with a radio. The police were taking notes on who was there, including us. I'm being filmed twice. There's a guy filming the guy filming me. It's quite flattering, actually. Hello, how are you? How are you? Hi, do you speak English? A little. Great, great. You're with the police here? Yeah. Great. So why are you here today? Security. Security, yeah. yeah. He was monosyllabic. His colleagues seemed bashful. So it will be peaceful here. He seems to have lost his appetite for this conversation. I know he's off. 
The families finally took the bodies away for burial. The slums of Diabaka are packed with Kurds who were displaced from their villages. This is the neighborhood where just on Sunday, which was five days ago, there were crowds of mourners because there was a PKK funeral here. We went to visit the brother and sister of one of the dead PKK men. I wanted to understand from them exactly what drove their brother to take up arms. She told me she remembered the Turkish commandos coming to her village, taking her brothers away to the police station and beating them. And she says that her brother who joined the PKK lived with these memories and never forgot them. She said she is not afraid. She would shed her blood, give her soul and would sacrifice herself and her five children. She said they will fight until the Turkish government recognizes them. And I just want to explain that what she's saying absolutely is enough for her to be arrested. They took us to their brother's grave. This simple grave is the grave of a man that the Turkish government considers a terrorist but to his brother and sister here, who are praying over the grave. He's a hero, someone who laid down his life for his people. And that chasm speaks to the conflict that still exists in Turkey and is in fact growing. To me, his death seemed pointless. The PKK no longer even want a separate state. They want a general amnesty and cultural recognition. Kurds still feel their culture is repressed. We stumbled across a Kurdish wedding. People told me their weddings are often raided by the police. It's Kurdish singing and Kurdish dancing. Some of the dancers are sort of twirling around the Kurdish colors. And it's a celebration, but it's also an act of defiance. It was a Wednesday morning. That meant it was time for the weekly half hour of Kurdish programming on state TV, a result of pressure from the EU. We tried to find somewhere to watch it. No one seems to know quite what channel it's on. This is it. What are they showing here? I'm trying not to laugh, but... This is a Kurdish program that even a Kurd doesn't understand because it's in a different accent or dialect. The only way that this Kurdish gentleman can understand the so-called Kurdish half hour of state programming per week is to read the Turkish subtitles. The program is a dull news summary that tells people what they already know from Turkish bulletins. way to Van, which is five hours drive from Diyarbakir, because we heard less than an hour ago that a big bomb has gone off this morning in Van, killing three people at least. This is just another escalation, but a big one. Yeah, this is like the shrapnel from the bombs. Stick your fingers in. It's all over. In a shop opposite the blast, they told me what had happened. He told me the street was like a river of blood, covered with broken glass. And there were bits of the bomber's body, people think this is a suicide bombing, bits of the bomber's body splattered all over the place. Another three people dead in this conflict that no one really seems to know is happening again. The following morning, the attack was confirmed as a suicide bombing. We now associate the tactic with Islamism, but the PKK has never lacked for suicide bombers willing to die for their cause. The bomber seemed to have mistaken a road worker's car for a police vehicle. Is he in a condition to talk? 
All of the victims, including this man, were Kurds. He told me he saw chaos all around. He saw someone's mutilated legs lying in the street. Do you sense that this is going to go on? He said they are concerned that the violence is increasing and that there are more attacks. And he lifts up his left arm and says, as you can see, it's, it's taking people's lives. In Diyarbakir, we heard claims that the security forces had been using old and dirty tactics against Kurds. Someone has garroted two old people who just happen to be the parents of men and women who are politically active Kurdish-wise. Their daughter was waiting for the bodies. All her brothers and sisters are political exiles. Why do you think your parents were killed and who do you think killed them? She says that she can't be sure and the family can't be sure, but then in the next breath she said they're 100% sure that it was government forces who killed her parents. The police were out in force. While we were down there talking to the family of the murdered couple, the police were talking to our driver, and coincidentally, he suddenly wants to go home. He says his wife is about to give birth, and he must leave today. That's the kind of thing that happens around here, and it's a little disturbing. Not to mention inconvenient, we have to find a new driver now. Once the autopsy was finished, the bodies were released for burial. We followed them in a new car. Sympathizers lined the road to greet the cortege as it swelled to a convoy of hundreds of mourners. It's not letting us through. Let's go. After 20 minutes, the cortege was allowed to continue to the village of Doanchai, home to the old couple. Well, what they're chanting is martyrs don't die. And you see they've got their thief of victory signs. And this is an explicitly political slogan. I noticed soldiers watching the mourners every move. Some senior officers apparently don't want Turkey to join the EU. Reforms threaten the power of the generals. Stoking the conflict would keep them strong. The fight was intensifying. In the two weeks we'd been here, at least 14 people had been killed on both sides. In Diyarbakir, I made an appointment to meet the city's Turkish governor. Such a welcoming party. I wasn't expecting this. Who has the power, the real power, in Turkey? Is it you and the government, or is it the army, the military? He told me they argue in Ankara over how the establishment fits together and the balance of power. It's a problem, he says. It's a key element of Turkey's accession to the EU, but we're working on it, he says. We've just heard that bodies of two of three policemen killed by the PKK in a clash last night in a town nearby called Batman are being taken to the airport. It's almost every day, it seems, that we're here. There's death on one side or the other. This is an intensifying conflict. I'm just kind of blending into the crowd here as much as possible. <laughs> Yeah, we, have, we have permission. Uh, we have permission. It was a military airbase. They didn't want it filmed. We've just seen five fighter jets take off instantly after the goodbye, the send-off. 
to the two bodies of the dead policemen. And I was told by the police that they're sad and they're angry. We traveled east, deeper into Kurdish Turkey. These mountains provide cover for the PKK. Working through secret intermediaries in Turkey and in Europe, we'd been trying to meet them. It was proving difficult. Turkish military presence here is high. We've just gone through our fourth checkpoint in about three hours. <laughs> we were assured in Ankara by the government that there were no checkpoints down here, neither military nor police. It's not true. Local people told us that the road east was almost blocked by snow. We were approaching the point where Turkey meets its most difficult neighbors. A villager has driven along with us because he knows exactly where the borders are and he's gonna show it. What's up there? Iraq. Iraq? Iraq. Iraq. Iran. Iran. At the top of this hill? Iran. It's not really a guarded border, I don't think. If within several years, let's say 10 years, Turkey becomes part of the EU, this is Europe. Right at the doorway of the Middle East, the doorway of a nuclear power, emergent nuclear power that way, with the fundamentalist government and a country that's racked by warfare. It's quite a thought. It's quite a thought. We reached the frontier town of Shemdinli at night. After a trip out of the hotel for dinner, we returned to find that news of our arrival had reached the police. On the other side of the room is a plainclothes policeman, at least one. And we were kind of wondering whether he would approach us. But he's just looking across at us, it seems. It didn't take them long to find out that we were here. Well, we got here last night. I couldn't really see what this place was like, and it's pretty spectacular, and it feels, I don't know, sort of claustrophobic. It's built for trouble, as someone told me and trouble is what happens here. A large number of Turkish soldiers are garrisoned in Şemdinli. Four months ago, someone threw two hand grenades into this Kurdish bookshop. The bomber was captured, and he turned out to be a Turkish soldier. The owner saw the attack. <laughs> He says that this is his friend's blood. He was killed right here. A senior general embarrassed the government by describing the bomber as a good guy. The general, Yasar Buchanan, is in line to be the next chief of staff. Why would an apparent security forces member and two others want to blow up you and your shop? He told me he was targeted because he was and is a member of Kurdish political parties and spent 15 years in prison. The army and what's called the deep state in Turkey, in other words, not the government, but the military establishment, is trying to create violence, is trying to create chaos, and as he put it, to push him and people like him back into the mountains. Our attempts to meet the PKK in Turkey failed. In the capital, Ankara, I asked to talk to an army official, but I was told this was not possible. Hi, Matt McAllister, Channel 4. I did go to meet the head of Turkey's EU Harmonization Committee, Yasar Yakish. I asked him if he thought the situation with the PKK was getting worse. Yes, it will go worse for the terrorists. I don't see a country of uh, 73 million inhabitants with an army of 800,000 people will surrender to a handful of, of terrorists. The PKK, by all accounts, are growing in numbers. Why do you think that is? Now that the northern Iraq has a tendency to declare its independence, Kurdish nationalism is in, in, in rising. Just because of Iraq? 
because the Kurds in Iraq are becoming stronger? I do not find any concrete thing that Turkey has done which will antagonize the Kurdish-speaking population of Turkey. All what was done was in favor of them. Finally, we received word that the PKK would meet us, not in Turkey, but in the north of Iraq. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. How are you doing? We've been met by senior people from the PKK. Certainly one of them is armed. This is where the majority of their 10,000 guerrillas are based. The United States has not allowed Turkey to further destabilize Iraq by attacking the PKK here. After a long drive, we arrived at their base. Thank you. I noticed the walls were decorated with portraits of PKK martyrs. PKK news addicts watched reports of more killings in Turkey. In the morning, we met some of the PKK's fighters at their training base. Some were fresh recruits. Well, we've been welcomed and not really been given a choice about whether to, hello, to uh, shake hands with every single one of the people. Everybody. I've yes. uh, shake hands with everybody. Hello. Hello. And how old is she? How old are you? Sixteen years old. Sixteen? Yep. What? As the desire of the She comes from Van and several members of her family are in the PKK. And just inside her jacket, she's got a hand grenade. We later found out she was, in fact, 15. They told me that the youngest was 14. I asked him why he wasn't in school. He gave a party-line answer about resisting Turkish oppression. We'd been told to expect one of the PKK's top leaders. Murad Karyalan is co-president of the PKK. After you. He blamed the Turkish army for the upsurge in violence. He told me it is not part of the PKK's strategy to continue the armed struggle. The Kurdish people have the right to defend themselves against Turkish army attacks. You say defend, but the PKK has been doing attacks inside Turkey. How is that defense exactly? He says that they call it active defense, and he believes that it's justified under international law that if you're consistently being attacked, it's your right to respond. The PKK leader reminded me of his enemies, the Turkish generals who prefer to fight than to talk. In fact, as Turkey edges closer to Europe, this conflict has never been more solvable. Sarah Smith with the More 4 News, starting very shortly over on More 4, with her take on today's latest breaking news. Tomorrow night, Channel 4, the highlight of the literary calendar and why 90,000 punters turn up to it on the way to The Hay, 10 past 7.